son that she's been waiting on got here Tuesday. Right? Tuesday? This morning. Oh, it was this morning. Okay, so that's an answer to prayer right there. That's one thing we've been waiting on. And also, I'd meant to do this during an uh, invitation. Go ahead and start the stream. That's fine. Maybe they see this. But here's the thing. Uh, Judy and I got a uh, message on Facebook from our daughter-in-law. And uh, our prayer is that my son and her and their kids will get in church. Uh, Aaron, at a young age, accepted the Lord as his Savior. I don't know that Carla ever has. Uh, but she reached out and she's asking for a prayer. She's a substitute teacher or a teacher's aide and she works in a classroom. She's been in this teacher's class for six years and I didn't realize that she is an, uh, you know, she's a believer. Uh, but her husband has been in ICU for 13 days with COVID. Uh, and she said that she has sat beside his bed um, and read the Bible and prayed all of those days. And she uh, you know, the only time I hear is if our, our granddaughter, if she needs some help with funds or whatever, but this is the first time she's reached out in this way, and I'm praying that God would heal this man, and that two, this teacher will have an opportunity to share her testimony, how the power of God healed her husband, and that Carla, that's her name, Carla will see the power of God, and see and give credit where credit's due. And uh, the, the, the man's name is Mike uh, Simon, and her name is Lisa, but we pray that he would be healed. But I'm just asking that God would do a powerful work in this time. Amen? So help me pray about that, okay? Cheryl, come and read our text for us. Morning, everyone. This is out of Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. It says, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'll start again. Uh, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these words. And Lord, I pray that we would walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we were called, that we would be humble and gentle with patience, that we, we would bear with one another in love, that we would be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Lord, I pray that you would help Pastor Al as he speaks today. I pray that you would give him love for each person that is listening and that you would help him to give a message that um, reaches us, Lord. And we pray that our ears would be open to your Holy Spirit, the one Spirit, the one God. And Lord, I pray that we would be open and listening and that you would move us, Lord, that we would have a spirit um, that would be open to your words. Lord, I thank you so much for this day and for everyone here. We do um, thank you for the new baby in the world. And we ask you to keep it healthy. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we continue in the book of Ephesians, one, I want to thank Andy for filling in for me last week. Our trip to uh, Missouri was pretty much uneventful. We got home safely. Judy's home. Hallelujah. Uh, I'm done. I'm complete now. Uh, I, I miss her when she's gone, and we were separated there for about two and a half weeks, and then up there it was it was just taking care of things. But I appreciate Andy stepping in, and and but as we look at the book of Ephesians, chapter four, we've moved on, and we're going to be get into a new series. We we're going to be talking about the church as a new creation. 
the church is a new creation. And that little sign, that symbol there, can anybody tell me what that means? Anybody? What is that a symbol for? DNA. DNA. Amen. You've got some scientists in the room. That's good. Scientists, you know, our DNA is something that people know us by. And I believe that in this chapter 4, we're going to see over today and the next few weeks uh, how our DNA has changed for a purpose, how we look at things, how we live, how we walk. But these first few verses really get the flow of what's going on. And I believe it's, it's to get us to a place that our DNA is, has been reworked. I, I say reworked, but I, th I think what we should look at is when we read Ephesians chapter 4, we need to look at not reworked, but to put it back to where it should have been. Uh, when God created us, He created us without sin. Sin is what came into our life that mutated the, the human beings that we know today. And because of sin, we see all the disease, the, the sickness, uh, all the different things that ail us, that gets us to a place that our body, because of the mutation that's went on through sin, it dies. That's the reason why death is here. We not, we're not gonna, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But with sin, we'd surely die, just as God said in the Garden of Eden. But he created us not to die. I believe we'd live forever. We'd still be running around with no clothes on in a garden where we didn't have to worry about things. We'd be doing the things that God intended for us to do had sin not come on the scene. But we need to get back to that, and that's what God did by sending his Son. And we're going to show that and prove that today, that we can be one, united as a body of believers, a new creation in Christ. The theme is still in Christ through the whole book of Ephesians. And Paul is very particular about this, and he, he talks about that. And leading into the first three verses, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you, beg you, he, he pleads with us uh, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you have been called. We should be different. We should live a life in Christ for the purpose of God. Amen? And that is the calling that we have. And how does that come to be? And it goes on. How do we show that? It says, with all humility and gentleness, patience, bearing with one another. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase there. Putting up with one another. Uh, you know, we need to do a better job of putting up with one another and encouraging each other. And know that we are together. And it says, in love eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, in the bond of peace. When we allow the DNA in our, our, our lives to change and to be as God had intended it from the beginning, we speak a new language, if you will, and that's the title of my sermon, the language of the believer. Sometimes I'm not talking about just what comes out of our mouth, although the mouth is a window of the heart, right? You will agree with that. What's in your heart is going to come out your mouth eventually. You can put on an act just so long. And in the heat of the moment, you're going to let what's really in your heart come out. Amen? I, I, I know. There's, my toes got stepped on there as well. When we get angry and we, we talk about somebody or we do something that's not very Christ-like, then we have lost our way. Our DNA has gone back to that way of sin, and we're not living as the calling in which God has called us to live. Amen. And I would go into this, and that was kind of a, where I had planned on starting. And Thursday, Andy and I had a good time, and, and we had a real good time in my office. I think it was about three hours this week, uh, just talking about things of the church, ministry, and, and scripture, and things like that. And then I said, well, you know, I might ought to see what Andy preached about Sunday. I didn't get a chance to watch it Sunday like I normally do, so I listened to it. And he covered the first three verses perfectly. So if you were here last week, you've got the... The, the, the beginning, the introduction. And I believe if you have missed that, go to Facebook uh, or YouTube, watch it, and you'll get more in-depth on these first three verses, okay? Uh, I bring that out also to say that, you know, some people say, why do we have Internet? Why do we do it? And I've got a lot of brothers that have decided they're not streaming anymore because they think it's keeping people from coming to church. And for some reason this week, I got on there and did the, went to see how our site was doing. How many were the followers? How many? 3,000? 2,000. We've got over 2,000 followers. Not just here in Bernalillo, not in New Mexico, but around the world. 
So the word is going out, and that is part of us uniting together as body in Christ, reaching those that are in the body of Christ all around the world. Amen? So that being said, I appreciate Andy uh, preaching last week and covering these first three verses. I mean, just spot on. But I one th- th- some of the verses that I had studied, I had part of my sermon laid out before. I didn't know Andy was going to preach on that, so... It it, it all works out, but there was three verses I really wanted to bring out where Paul, writing to other churches of that time, he wrote, and he, he, and I think it's, we need to hear those too. Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, that you what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, okay? Where Christ, uh, living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship or uh, duty, if you will. Uh, then we, we go to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and then uh, you have been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above with Christ, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. And I love this verse 2. Set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. And now what we're just saying, our DNA needs to go back to the things above, what God created us to be, and that was to worship and to serve Him. Uh, then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Finally, then brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that you uh, receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing. So he gave them some kudos there, and I think we're doing a lot of good things here, uh, that you do so more and more, meaning we need to grow. The things that we're doing doesn't mean we just stay where we're at. If you stay in that state, you become stagnant. We need to keep moving and growing and seeing things enlarge, okay? Whether that be our knowledge, whether that be our giving, whether that be our praying, whether that mean our service on Tuesdays or out in the community in our, in our neighborhoods, we need to continue to grow. As we learn something today, we add it to our vocabulary uh, you know, Grayson was out here. He can string a few words together. His vocabulary is limited because he's young. As Christians, as we grow, our vocabulary needs to be more and more and more. We need to use God's word that we learn to have the DNA to grow and to show others. Amen? Amen, preacher. That's good preaching. And then verse 2, it says, For you know that uh, what instructions we have gave you through the Lord Jesus. What instructions do we live by here at First Baptist Church? God's Word, amen. Basic instructions before leaving earth. We need to know what God's Word says so that we can do those first three verses that we talked about, verses 1 through 3. But I want us to get back to this item of DNA. Um, In Christ, we sang two songs about the blood. There's power in the blood. Are you washed in the blood? Those songs have so much truth in them and give us the ability to see a change and go back to that idea of DNA. Our DNA is in our blood and how we're structured in a way to do the things of God. We focus on the things that we do for us. We tend to focus on the things of the world. This afternoon, there's going to be a lot of people watching football. It's only the second week. Sam probably won't be watching. His quarterback got taken out last week. But anyway, amen. And the thing is, is that we get so wrapped up and so excited, enthusiastic about things of the world. Um, Miss, Miss, Miss Lissette's going to be pulling for the, the Pittsburgh Steelers. I know that. Me and Andy are going to be pulling for, well, the commanders now. Uh, but there, we have our teams. But how do we live our lives as far as our creation and how we are? Who do we see our, whose team are we on? Amen? Whose team are we on? We come to church, yes. We come to church. We got a name out here on the sign. It says First Baptist Church. But that should not be our sign. You know, somebody says, well, what's different about you? Well, I go to First Baptist Church. You know, I had a lady one time, I knocked on her door down in Florida. Hey, we're just out asking people, inviting them to church. Is there anything we can pray for you? Or, uh, and then, you know, if you died today, you know you'd go to heaven. She says, I'll have you know I go to First Baptist Church of Leesburg. And she slammed the door in my face. And, I, you know, I, I sometimes get it, people bothering me. It was a Saturday morning. 
But going to First Baptist Church is not what team you're on. This is where we gather. This is where we get have our pep rallies maybe. But the team we own is based on who God is and how we're one as a family. How we look at those in Japan. How we look at those in Russia. How we look at those in Brazil. And all those that have come to a knowledge of who Christ is and in one in Christ, we can understand a little better what this whole idea of the body of Christ is all about as a new creation. Something that's different from the world. And I believe Paul does a good job. He provides us with the grounds and the theological basis and all this about unity as one family in one Christ. And we're going to get into that. And he uses this in a sevenfold repetition of the word one. One, united. One in mind, spirit, and soul. And I believe we need to get that to understand how this DNA will make us one in Christ and bring us to be able to change the language that people around us see, hear, just our conversation in itself. You've heard the saying, you know, you may be the only Bible somebody reads. How is that language translating in your life? And that's what I want us to see. And Paul is doing a very good job to teach us this seven, these seven wonderful spiritual facts and what I want us to get today, and I want us to consider this on the back of your bulletin. I don't think we got any visitors, uh, is my outline and some things there. Uh, but I want us to ask this question. Being called, we've, we've talked, we've been called, we've been changed, you know, that's the first three chapters. Uh, does my life speak the significance of one in Christ? Now think about it. The significance of being one in Christ. What you believe will be heard by your neighbors and how you live your life. How you live your life on Monday is going to be on, about your relationship and how you are one in Christ. Gavin and I were doing our, our Sunday school this morning in Psalm 119, verse 79. It kind of rang true, and I said, hold on, Gavin, I need to go put this in my outline, and I'm going to share it with you because it just kind of rang true of what we're trying to do today. In Psalm 119, verse 79, it says, Let those who fear you turn to me. Talking about David wrote this. He said, turn to me, those that fear you, those that acknowledge your presence. Or I think it also could touch those that are fear because they have no wisdom of God. Remember, the beginning, uh, fear is the beginning of all wisdom, knowing who God is and how we're united in one. And as a comment says, that they may know your testimonies. Let them look at me that they might know your testimonies. And I believe that's a good challenge for us that we might live in a way that we consider us being one in Christ. Point number one, there is only one body. Now I'm not going to go back and re-preach what we preached about in, in chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three. But in one body we see that through Christ... Jews and Gentiles were brought to one body of believers through the blood of Christ. Amen? So that we now become Christians and we are a part of one body. But I believe in this context here, it's Christ's body, the church. We are united and we say, well, I'm a part of this body of believers. I'm a member of First Baptist Church. Our testimony goes out long before we, we introduce ourselves as being a member here. Although there are many members of this church, the, the, there's different gifts that are in place in this church. Each of you have a special gift that God has given you. Some of you can do things like uh, sing. I can't sing very well. I can sing along. I might can try to sing, but some of you do a much better job of it. So you've been blessed with that. Now, I'm not talking about the gifts of the Spirit, the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. We all have those nine characteristics. We just need to show them a little bit more. But they're special, special gifts. Uh, Lisette and Steve have a special way with numbers. That's the reason why God has gifted us with some good people who can look at our numbers and help us with our finances and things like that. Uh, Miss Carol, she's got a, a, a gift of getting things done. I like her. I mean, you know, she does a lot of things that I don't have to worry about. 
Angela has a good job of keeping Sam straight. Amen? Amen? Uh, there's gifts. But Sam in himself, I mean, he is a, pro, a procurer. Have, if, is that the right word? He gets, he gets things that we can give away on Tuesdays. That's a gift. I can't do that. There's all of us and put together. And if I didn't call your name, it's not because I don't see your gifts. Okay? But as together, when we are one in Christ, we're a body in Christ, we do the work of Christ. And that means we're to do what it is He's called us to do. In Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same functions, we, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individual members one of another. Have you thought about that one that you're arguing about that's coming to church right now? You say, well, they did this, that, and the other. And they're your brothers or sister. They're part of this body. And we shouldn't be sitting there tearing them down. We're united together to do a work. In Colossians 3, verse 15, it says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. Be so thankful. Amen? I think if we can get that, we'll understand more about one body in Christ. Amen? Now, one thing I have incorporated into my sermon is how to memorize a verse. Maybe by the end of today's message, you'll know this, these two verses. Because I'm going to repeat it up to that point, each point. Okay? Point number two, there is one spirit. In verse four, it says there is one body and one spirit. The Holy Spirit. Amen? The Holy Spirit. Now, if you read Ephesians and you're not tagging into where the Holy Spirit is, you're missing the big picture. Ephesians has a lot to help us understand the power that we have through the Spirit of God. Uh, and I believe Paul does a great job in the chapters. In, you know, in chapter 1, verse 13, we see we are sealed in the Spirit. In chapter 2, verse 18, we see we have access to the Father through the Spirit. In cha uh, chapter 2, verse 22, we are dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And verse 4, strengthened in the inner man through the Spirit. And today and now, here in chapter 4, verse 3, we are graced with the unity of the Spirit. My brother down in Florida, Brother Bruce, he used to always pray, and he'd say, thank you for the Spirit, the tie that binds, the tie that brings us together, that makes me feel a part of Steve or Pauline or Abel, that I know that I can go to them as brothers or sisters and I'm, I'm drawn to them as my brothers and sisters, that they can help me. See, I look to you just as much as you look to me. When you miss church, you miss the opportunity to allow the Spirit to speak through you what I might need. We come together and we, if we're going to have unity, we, we shouldn't say, well, uh, I'm just going to miss. I don't really feel like going to church today. See, the Holy Spirit's going to say, oh, no, 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 no. Because, you know, that's the reason it's a battle. That's the reason why if you're just not wanting to go to church and you don't give it much thought, then you need to get right with the Lord. Because here's what I have found. If we come to church, it's not always what I get. Sometimes God's going to use me to speak to somebody else that needs it. So if I don't go, I can't, I can't supply that need, that unity that I have in my brothers and sisters. We all have a gift, remember? We all have a part in the body. So in one body and in one spirit, we need to hold true. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we read, All uh, these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as his will, as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what draws us together. The, the video that Brother Steve was showing us about how we're to, to produce Christ together to go fishing. And that is to get them that they can drink the living water. That is the Holy Spirit. 
That is what we have to do. And are we empowering the Spirit to, as one in unity? You see, if one match, we hold it and we bring another match alongside it and we keep all showing our light. And light is very important at the get, as we get to the end of this sermon today. It gets brighter and brighter and brighter to the point that people have to actually, I think I heard Andy speaking a little bit, you know, Moses' face, he had to cover it with a veil because he was so bright. He, and, and people got to be sat there and say, man, what's different about you? And we have to get to the place that our DNA is in a way that we speak this Holy Spirit and we, we allow it to empower us. Point number three, there is one hope. One hope. Now, he kind of changes gears on us here. He breaks it up. But in this, per, this particular word, hope, he reflects back to the last two. There's one body, one spirit. But he goes on, just as you were called to the one hope, that belongs to your call. Now, we can sit there and say that I have hope to live. I have hope to, to do this. I have hope that God's going to take care of my needs. I have hope that God's going to feed me. And those are all things that we can look to our Father who has promised us that He will take care of us. But that is not how we need to look at this. This hope that we have is not because of what we're going to get. Even the eternal, and that's where this falls into, is the eternal life in Christ. But what it is that we're looking at. Um, I wrote down this, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. The hope to which Paul refers is not the subjective feeling of the confident expectation, but it's the content in which one hope for today's life. That song we sang, the reason I did it was primarily to get us to understand that in Christ we find all that we need. Eternal life begins the moment you believe and accept Jesus as Lord of your life. You now have that personal spirit, Holy Spirit, that, that, that bond and unity that you have not only with God but with your brothers and sisters, the one body that we come together to meet at, but the hope that we have and the reason we do what we do is that we know who Jesus is. Amen. And we're not sharing that like we could and we're not given the hope that we should be presenting when we are disgruntled when we're arguing amongst ourselves, and when we just have dis differences of opinion. Through Christ, we should always be able to come together and talk in unity. Even if we don't understand, maybe we don't agree. Now, I, I use Andy all the time, but this is a very good point. Y'all think me and Andy just, I mean, we are, we're friends, we're buddies. Uh, we go out of our way to have conversation and to do things. But there are times that I probably rub Andy the wrong way. Not really. <laughs> he's being, he's showing humility right now. And there are times that Andy sometimes, not very often, rub me the wrong way. But at the end of the conversation... We always give each other a hug. I love you, brother. Because we come together as one in the hope that we have, that we have been changed. Our DNA, our, our, our vocabulary, our language is to a point, even though we disagree based on an opinion, and we have a lot of opinions here at First Baptist Church. I'll just let you all know that if you didn't know that already. But if it's centered on Christ we will always find that place that we come together. Amen? So that's the hope in which we need to grow on in our, our verses here. And Peter says it so good. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we read, blessed be, God, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to the great mercy, He has caused us to be born again in a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then 1 Peter 3.15, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. I ask the question, do I live in a positive hope because Jesus is living through my life? 
the hope that I have gives me understanding. If I go back to Galatians 2.20, and we all know that verse, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer that I live, but Christ that liveth in me. Amen. And in the life that I live is in the flesh. I live in faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And if we get to that place, we can go to point number four, and it says there is one Lord. Uh, the verse, starting with verse 5, this is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord. Jesus. Jesus. That's the reason why we have to confess Jesus as Lord. It's not that we worship Washington or Santa Fe or anything else. What God's talking about is at, from the garden that we started worshiping as Lord ourselves. We make ourselves the Lord of our lives. I will make the decisions. I will decide which direction I'm going to go. I will decide what my finances are. I will decide what flavor of ice cream I'm going to eat. There's a part that you have to get to the place that you recognize as one in Christ, that Jesus Christ himself is that one in control. He is the one to lead us. One Lord, Claire, uh, it refers to Jesus, and, and Paul mentions the Spirit in verse 4, and he mentions God, and he's gonna, we're going to see that in verse 6, but we have to see the triune God in this in one in Christ. And that's how he is Lord. In 1 Corinthians verse eight or chapter 8, verse 6, it says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for, all, for whom we exist. And I like that, how, why we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. See, through Christ alone is how we become part of the body of Christ. And we're united with Christ through his blood through His Spirit. That's why we can say we're one body. That's the reason we can say we have one Spirit. That's why we can have this hope. is because Jesus is the Lord. We're following Him. We become one as a, as a, a, as the Scottish people say, a clan. A clan of believers. I like that. And we pull together. And it, it, it doesn't matter what anybody says. We're going to unite and defend one another and stand on the very fact that Jesus is leading the way. No matter what we think amongst ourselves, we're going to follow Jesus. And we need to get to that place. In Romans 10 verse 9 it says, Because if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. As saved from the wrath of God. As saved from a punishment of eternal separation from him. We also look at Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 10, so that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Whether you confess him as Lord today or you do it at the throne, you will bow your knee and confess him Lord. Do I live as though my existence is because and for our Lord Jesus? Can we answer that question truthfully and say, yes, I live as Jesus leading me? Do I say things in accordance to what God has said through his word? Do I act in accordance to how Jesus would act? These are things we need to ask ourselves. If we're going to speak the language of God, we need to live as united in Christ alone. Point number five, there is one faith. Verse 5, it goes on, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, and that is the Christian faith. We talked about Jews and Gentiles when we come together through the blood of Christ. We now become Christians, and that is the faith. We believe that He changes our DNA in a way that we go back to the creation in which God intended for us to live. So when we act un unruly and we act against the will of God, what happens? Hopefully you feel conviction. The Spirit says that's not what we need to be doing. When we say things against our brothers and sisters, I hope we have conviction at some point that we say, well, that wasn't very humble or peaceful or edifying or lifting up. Let me go apologize and say, look, I was wrong here. Here's what I was saying. You can explain yourself. Sometimes how we present things is when we mess up. 
but we need to unify. And with God or Jesus being our Lord, we, we do those things and we have the faith that He will do it through us. See, it's not just being a Christian, but what is the... I'm talking about actions. I'm talking about things we expect from God. I, I really wish the Lord would help us with this building project we've got going on. I have faith that we're going to have some bathrooms in the back here. We need some bathrooms, amen? But my faith is not that we're going to get a contractor and have the money and build these bathrooms. My faith is in the Lord. My faith is in God. My faith in is what He is going to do for His purpose. Everything's going to happen for the good of those that are called, called according to His purpose. If we as a body of believers have one spirit, one, one hope, one, one Lord, then we're going to see that our faith will be based on the one who's going to take care of it all. Galatians chapter 3 and start with verse 23. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law. Now, we're going back to the Old Testament. And he's going to explain how Christ changes everything. Imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was the guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, but in Christ Jesus you all are sons of God through faith. Faith in who the Lord is. Faith in what He can do in us, through us. We're to uh, uh, manifest the body of Christ. In Christ alone we can grow and do. Do I live as one who is a child of God and a brother of Jesus? You see, people will know your faith by the one that you follow. People will know your faith how you act when bad things happen. I could expand a lot. I, I just uh, Here's the thing. This building project, and I use that for, for this reason. Uh, we did get a bid, and it was kind of outside of our realm of possibility. Okay? I have faith that God's will is going to be done, that God, if he so chooses, it's going to happen. That means that either somebody's going to say, well, you know, I've got this money. I'm probably never going to use it. I'll just give it to y'all to help build them bathrooms. That would be great. That would be God doing that. It might be that a contractor calls us up and gets inside of the window of our possibility and I would say, hallelujah, I'd do a happy dance, run around the building and all that. But it's not because we got the contract that we can afford, but that God changed the heart of a contractor to be the price in which we could afford based on the blessings of God. You see how it all goes to faith to God. Not in our abilities. Not in what somebody does here on this earth, but what God does. That's where our faith needs to be hinged. I hope we start getting that. I remember walking across the street to a city council meeting when we were trying to get our sign out front. And Carol says, you know, we gotta, we got to explain this. And Carol and I were, you know, we, it was the first time we'd done a city council meeting and we were a little anxious about it. And Carol said, what, what, you know, what if they say no? I said, well, look. And my faith was this. And I, I, well, I really said this. And I said, you know, God didn't give us $20,000 for him not to make them change their mind to say, okay, you can build the sign. I had faith that God was going to change their hearts. The vote went through, and guess what? We got to build the sign. That's why we got a beautiful sign out front. It's not because somebody gave the money. It's not because we went to the city council, although Carol said, you've got to do all the talking. And I said, I don't have a problem with talking, and y'all know that. Amen. Wow. <laughs> but here's the thing. It's not what we're doing. It's we have faith in God. Amen? Amen. What He's doing. Amen. Number six, there is one baptism. There's one body, one spirit, and just as you were called in the one hope and belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. This baptism of the spirit into God Christ's body. This is all about the baptism. And I'm, you know, I, I, I don't know if you are, are, know F.F. F. Bruce. He's a commentator. Uh, but I like his, his writings. I have several of his books. 
Uh, but some people want to, they want to put the emphasis on the, the water baptism, and others want to put the emphasis on spiritual baptism. But here's the thing, I, and I agree with what he says. It is beside the point to ask whether it's baptism in water or baptism in spirit. It is a Christian baptism. And he expounds on that, and he says, Baptism into the name of Lord Jesus, you get that? It's that we accept him as our Lord, and when we do that, we're baptized with the Spirit. The Spirit dwells us. Amen? And we show our commitment to the Lord to be baptized with water in order that we can say, I now follow the Lord. I'm committed to his work through that, my faith in him. All right? So we have to have both. He says, indeed, involving the application of water, we do have that, but it's closely associated with the gift of the Spirit. In Romans chapter 6, verse 4, we read, We are buried, therefore, with him in baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. See, when we're baptized, one baptism, and knowing that it, we're being baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection, hallelujah, that's baptism. That's the reason why I have everybody read Romans chapter 6 before we baptize them. When we bury our old selves, Galatians 2.20, we've already talked about that. We nail ourselves to the cross. We die to self. We're raised in the likeness and the newness of life because we're raised in His resurrection. And one day, hallelujah, we'll get a glorified body that's not been tainted with sin. But for the meanwhile, do we commit ourselves as a new creature speaking the language with a new DNA of what God anticipated and wants us to do? He has called us to do a job. So we commit to that by being buried in His likeness of His death Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Hallelujah. That's why we, we, we require baptism to be a member of our church. Okay, so that being said, we, do we profess and live in newness of life? That's a question only you can answer. And then we got point number seven. There is one God and Father. Verse 6 says, There is one body and one, one spirit, just as you were called, to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The Heavenly Father, in the beginning, God. It all starts with God. I can't explain how you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and then be united in one. Isn't that what we're trying to talk about today, being one in Christ? We can draw pictures, and I can do that, and I can show you how they connect and how they overlap and how each are, are the same but yet different. But when we understand who God is, the Father, then we can see through His plan. Remember the first sermon we spoke about in Ephesians, that God had a plan? That when He unites us, one in Christ, we actually become part of that body as well. And I want to show you that. Paul declares in, in, in this passage uh, the supreme sovereignty, um, omnipotence, all-knowing in the presence of His creation. He wants us to understand the Trinity in a way that we become united with that Trinity. In John chapter 3, we all know verse 16, but I want to go on to verse 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his Son, that whosoever believes him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him, united with him, Kept from that separation that we talked about a while ago. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has believed in the name of the Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light. The light. Has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked thinks, uh, things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. 
But verse 21 is so heavy with what we're trying to get today is that we are united in Christ for the purpose of Christ. And it says, but whoever does what is true comes to the light. They come to Christ. We're filled with the light of the Spirit. And we have God to thank for that. So that it may be clearly seen that His work have been carried out in God. When we're united because of God, He said, I created you this way. He started it. He created us. The Father, Son, and the Spirit were all together there that day. And they did this. But the light is what we need to be drawn to. When I was in the Navy, we'd be out in the middle of the ocean and we, we'd be trying to see our way and, and, and every once in a while we'd stick that periscope up and we would look for lights on the horizon. You see, there needs to be light in our lives that others might be able to see where they're going. We need to be lighthouses. We need to show that we're united with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have this one hope. We have this one faith. And it's all because of what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. That powerful blood. But you see, the blood is what changes. And when we have that DNA changed in us, we can understand better what James said in chapter 1, verse 16. It said, Do not be deceived, my brothers, my beloved brothers. He, he must have read the, where we're supposed to be united, right? He said, For every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, when whom he, there is no variation and shadow due to change, on his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, and we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. We need to get back to what God created. We need to change the DNA and how we talk and how we act and how we live our lives in a way that people can see Christ in us. Do I live as a kind of first fruits of God's creation? I asked you a while ago, being called, does, the, does your, my life speak the significance of wanting Christ? And in your application, I want everybody to turn to John chapter 17. And while you're turning there, I'm going to go ahead and read it. I want you to turn there and I want you to mark it because I want you to go back and read the whole chapter later this afternoon. But the point that ties a bow on everything we've said today as we talk about being one in Christ and what I just said in my last point and how we're tied to God through Christ. These are the words of Jesus as he talked to the Father. And he said, this is the reason I came. And then he looks down the annals of time and he sees you and me here today. And this prayer is an answer if we follow. And here's what Jesus said, they, uh, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, and they may be one, even as we are one. I and them and you and me and they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Hallelujah. Let that sink in for just a moment. Next time we want to be disgruntled or next time we want to be up, uh, 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 opposing each other in the purpose of Christ. Next time we, we have ought with a brother and we're not willing to go because we just, I'm not going to talk to them anymore. Next time we look at our church and say, well, we're not one. We're fractured. Well, it shouldn't be that way. Amen. We should be working together. Amen. And I think we should be coming together in a way that it's not just our opinion and feelings, but what Jesus just prayed right here, that we can be one in each other and be one in Christ and therefore be one in God. It's a challenge. And I believe that's the very reason why God said, Paul, I need you to write this down. And the Holy Spirit said, here's what you pen. And that's why we have Ephesians chapter 4. 
Let us understand that we are one in Christ. Let us fulfill this prayer. Let us be an answer to this prayer. Let us seek the answer of this prayer in our lives. First, you've got to accept the Lord as your Savior. You have to submit to that. Second, you've got to say, well, he's, he's Lord of my life, so therefore I'm going to do it his way. And then go look for others and teach them who the Lord is. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you loved us and you sent Jesus. And because Jesus was willing to lay down his life, be crucified on a a cross of shame, he died, he shed his blood, he was made sin for us. But Lord, in his resurrection, you also give us the ability to be raised a new creature. And because of the Holy Spirit entering us, that we become your temple, that we become your people, your creation. And we get back to the basics of what you created us for. That we can reach a lost and dying world. Yes, Jesus is there on the throne beside you. He's preparing a place for us, the church, the body of believers. But Lord, you've left us here to do your work. To fulfill your purpose. Let us be mindful of that. Now there might be somebody here today. I pray that you would touch their heart if they've not made that commitment. I don't know where they're at. I don't know how you're dealing with them. But you do. And your Holy Spirit is more powerful and stronger than anything we could even imagine. Just as you drew me and many of my brothers and sisters, I pray that through your Holy Spirit you would draw that one that's not complete. They're not one in Christ. They're lost. They're undone. They have no hope. Their faith is on this, that, and the other. Lord, I pray that you would show yourself so powerful this morning. They can't resist. And I thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to...